So what do you see when you see this card? Well, many articles are claiming that Meta's new AI can understand images similar to how humans do. I don't know how much of that is true or how much of it is just an attention grabbing tagline. To me, it's important to understand what the network does at a technical level and have enough information to decide for ourselves how we see it. And so today we are talking about all of that. We are talking about this new paper called Self-Supervised Learning from Images with a Joint Embedding Predictive Architecture that introduces iJEPA. So what's so special about this model? How does it work? And why could this be important for the future of computer vision research? Let's discuss all of that in this episode of Neural Breakdown, a series where I explain emerging research in machine learning and AI, and also provide some technical and intuitive background about some of the fundamentals that these new algorithms are built on. If you like this video, do hit the like button and let me know in the comments. Your feedback means a lot to me. Um, let's go. So minus all the memories I have with this card, I see a Valentine's or a Friendship Day card with a cartoony smiling bear, some text um, and a lovely homely vibe uh, that comes from it. Um, as humans, we view objects, colors and shapes in the world as concepts, ideas and high level abstractions. Jan Lacuna, a pioneer of computer vision and the founding father of convolutional neural networks, wrote this really interesting, perhaps seminal paper on his ideologies on how autonomous AI models can be built using machine learning that learn to view the world and understand the world as humans or animals do. And there he coined the term Joint Embedding Predictive Architectures or JEPA. So unlike some generative architectures that learn to generate images by predicting pixel values, JEPA architectures learn in the latent embedding space of the images. To fully understand the nuances and advantages of this technique, we first need to step back and understand two common alternatives to this technique, mainly view invariance-based models and generative-based models. So generative approaches train computer vision models by adding some perturbations to the image and then pass it through a neural network to try to reconstruct the original image pixel by pixel. Uh, the OG image encoder is perhaps the autoencoder, where the training image is passed through a much lower dimensional bottleneck to obtain a latent embedding and then reconstruct the original image back from this lower dimensional space. There are also modern transformer-based methods like the masked autoencoder that divides the images into multiple non-overlapping patches and mask out a random selection of the image and then train the model to reconstruct the missing pixels from the input image. The other approach is view invariance based joint embedding methods. Here we generate random augmentations of a batch of input images and basically train the model to discriminate between which augmentations are from the same image and which aren't. Basically we want the embeddings of similar images to be mapped close to each other and these similar images to be mapped farther apart. Uh, however, one of the long-standing issues with methods like this is called representation collapse, where the neural network's embeddings become overly concentrated or collapsed to a small region in the embedding space and they aren't diverse enough to differentiate between incompatible images. Uh, one popular way to combat this is contrastive learning, where along with positive pairs of examples, the network is also shown negative examples and asked to minimize the distance between pairs of augmentations coming from the same image and maximize the distance between the negative pairs. An example of this is the SimClear model that uses contrastive learning to correlate different augmentations of the same image, like cropping, translating, color correcting, and more. So I've previously made a video about multimodal machine learning that covers a lot of other applications of contrastive learning. And I link that in the description below if you people are interested. Other than contrastive learning, there are other approaches to view invariance-based methods as well, like clustering, information maximization, asymmetric architectural design, design, but those are topics for a separate video. Both generative and invariance-based methods are well-researched topics in the field of self-supervised learning. Because they are self-supervised, we can learn representative embeddings from a large volume of unlabeled images available on the internet. To use these pre-trained networks on downstream supervised tasks like classification, which does require labels, we can add small trainable layers on top of the pre-trained encoder part of the network and then fine-tune the model on the target dataset. High quality, self-supervised pre-training makes the downstream supervised training much less data hungry because the neural network will already have learned good image representation during pre-training. But there are, however, certain issues with both these classes of methods that the iJPA paper addresses. So generative methods are trained to learn pixel level details, which is unnecessary to form good image representations like 
is learning the exact color of this bear's nose at this particular location really that important? And on the other hand, invariance-based methods are susceptible to representation collapse, as I just talked about, but they can also be really sensitive to the kind of augmentations or distortions that we used. So aggressive augmentations might result in the image losing key information, and that makes the training process noisy and unproductive. The iJPA method's architecture is quite simple. The goal is similar to mask autoencoders, that is to predict representations of various target blocks of an image given a context block from the same image. However, instead of directly predicting pixel values like mask autoencoders do, iJPA works entirely in the latent embedding space. Here's how. The model uses two vision transformer encoder blocks, the context encoder and the target encoder. Given an input image, we divide it up into a sequence of non-overlapping patches and then input them through the target encoder to obtain embeddings for each patch. From these patches, a random selection of target blocks are selected for the loss calculation. The context patch, on the other hand, is obtained by randomly taking a factor of 0.85 to 1 from the images. Using the context encoder, we obtain the context embedding of the input context patches. And finally, we have a third vision transformer they call the predictor network that inputs the context embeddings and the positional encoding of the target patch that we want to predict and then generate a prediction of the target embedding. The loss to train the network is simply the L2 distance from these predictions and the actual target embeddings that we obtain through the target encoder. Note that the loss is only used to update the weights of the context encoder and the predictor network. The target encoder weights, on the other hand, is not updated via gradient descent and instead updated at each iteration via an exponentially moving average of the context encoder's weights. This type of weight averaging is very common in joint embedding training since it introduces asymmetry in the training architecture and reduces the chance of, of representation collapse. Although the iJPA model is actually heavier than a mask autoencoder, its training target is more abstract than pixel reconstruction methods. That's why iJPA models converge in five times less iterations compared to masked autoencoders. iJPA also avoids all the augmentation on the steps required for view invariance models, speeding up the training and removing the flakiness that comes with augmentation approaches. Additionally, this architecture is not just limited to images, but can be applied to other domains as well, like audio and text. This paper heavily references the data to vec paper that uses a similar strategy to train self-supervised models on a variety of different modalities. I'll leave a link to that paper in the description below if you people are interested. The authors compare the model's transfer learning performance on the ImageNet dataset. They freeze their encoder weights, add a single trainable linear layer to predict classes from input images. The results show that iJPA outperforms Max autoencoders. However, it falls behind augmentation techniques like Dino and SimClear. Using a large vision transformer model, however, does match the performance of those view invariance augmentation-based models. They also show similar results with the ImageNet 1% task, where only 1% of the data is used during training, meaning it achieves good scores with just seeing 12 to 13 images per label. That's really exciting. And they also report two non-classification tasks like depth prediction and object counting, where the iJPA method outright beats augmentation methods. Um, to qualitatively assess the learned embedding space, the authors train a RCDM or a representation conditional diffusion model to generate images pixel by pixel directly from the latent embedding space. And this shows that the learned embeddings capture enough information to reconstruct object parts of the original image, like the back of the bird, the top of the car, or the hind legs of the dog. To recap the advantages, iJPA doesn't require augmentation strategies common in view invariance models. It also converges faster than the generative models because it doesn't have to focus on learning unnecessary pixel level details. It's also computationally scalable, less data hungry on transfer learning task, and it learns a high semantic information that's generalizable across multiple transfer learning tasks. Now, I don't know exactly what to make about the headlines of neural networks can now see just as humans do. I don't know how much of that is true or how much of it is just an attention grabbing tagline. Uh, so leave a comment down below and share your thoughts. And as always, don't forget to subscribe because you are magnificent.